Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Corporate Scrutiny Committee meeting of Tamarborough Council on the 14th of March. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that the meeting is being recorded as normal and will be uploaded to YouTube. Um, I haven't received any apologies. Has anyone got any to add? Looks like I've got a full house. Good. Um, not from members, but from attendees. We have apologies from uh, Councillor Alex Farrell, portfolio holder, uh, who could make last, um, couldn't make because he's on holiday, I believe. Um, and then, last thing on this item, just thank everybody for being flexible and uh, moving the meeting from last Thursday to, to tonight. It's so we can have better attendance, and hopefully that will mean we get a better uh, scrutiny meeting out of it. Item number two: Do we have any declarations of interest to be declared? No. Um, item three, update from me. Um, the only update really is what we're going to cover in item four, which is responses to reports of the Corporate Scrutiny Committee. Um, as you remember, this committee made recommendations at the 8th of February meeting um, from the committee of the Leaseholder Charges Communication Working Group. Um, they were presented by Councillor Danny Cook, Vice Chair, to Cabinet at its meeting on the 23rd of February and were largely accepted. Um, we have the minutes here which I can read out, but before I do that, I just thought it might be worthwhile handing over to you and just give a brief summary of how that went. That's okay? Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, firstly, as I said on the night, uh, thank you to Councillors Chris Cook and Councillors Michelle Cook. As you know, we've been the real driving force uh, behind uh, this scrutiny item. Um, I had the pleasure of presenting it to Cabinet due to my position as uh, Vice Chair of this committee, but also thank you to Councillor Sherry People, Councillor John Apper and Councillor Sam Goodall. I thought it was, you know, all the years I've on this, on this council, it was a superb piece of scrutiny. It was well balanced, well thought out. We didn't rush anything, so really good piece of scrutiny. So thank you to everybody been involved. Uh, as you say, we're presented to Cabinet. Uh, I think Cabinet in the main took on board the points we were making, understood the research we put in. Cabinet absolutely correctly have taken a few items away to research what's the possibilities, what are the risks to the council, what are the risks to legality. Absolutely correct. Uh, so we're waiting for some feedback on some of the items. But I think in the main, it's been taken on the board that the council does have a little bit of learning to do from um, you know how we treat leaseholders in certain aspects. Again, no officer or member at the council has broken any legality or any act of parliament. It's just learning on how we communicate. So we, we I think, felt it was good feedback from the committee. Uh, with your permission, Mr Chairman, I invite Chris or Michelle to comment. But I think in the main, it was taken as positive and hope to see some improvements in that area. And again, it, I think it's just a good example of what happens when we sit down collectively together and actually tackle an issue that actually we can make strides forward. So yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Would you like to add anything? Councillor Michelle Cook. Thanks. Yeah, just to add about the fact that um, Cabinet did say that they'd got a number of things that they wanted to refer back to scrutiny as well. So at some point, it'd be good to see that sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we're coming up to the end of a year, and there's at least kind of Chris and myself that are both potentially not going to be here in May. So it'd be really good to kind of try and get that moving forward. Um, but also, whatever happens, making sure that's on the agenda again for next year as well, because there are still a number of residents that are sitting and waiting to know what's going to happen on this matter. So, yeah. But overall, again, echo Councillor other Danny Cook, um, Cook's um, comments to say it was a really good piece of scrutiny, and thanks for everyone's involvement. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so just an update for everybody else. Oh, Councillor Chris Cook. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you about that. Um, just to echo everybody's words, it was a really excellent bit of scrutiny. Um, I mean, as we're just sitting waiting on the uh, couple of bits for back from the uh, cabinet, etc., and um, I've updated uh, the residents. We've had uh, communications after that as well, which I think um, uh, Danny and uh, uh, so, 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 so. Uh, Michelle have also had off them as well. Um, what I would like to do is, as this is kind of going on, just um, keep the group which we've got open. And then obviously if we have anything um, uh, um, further off that, then we can all uh, 
carry on again afterwards. Thank you. Yep, I think that's a good idea. Thank you. So just to update everyone, <clears throat> there were seven recommendations which uh, Councillor Danny Cook presented on our behalf. All of them were agreed except for one, which was uh, item five, referred back to corporate. Oh no, it was referred. Referred back to corporate scrutiny. Da, da, da. Is that referring back to us? Yeah. Is that their wording? <clears throat> okay, I thought it was our wording. Okay. So they referred back to us that the committee look at the process requesting at least two face to face drop ins of residents before any work commences. And this committee should consider whether this is for all works or works over a certain monetary threshold. <clears throat> so that already sounds like, like you mentioned there, that if that subgroup continues looking at that item, we can get that back. Um, and then this has been added to the actions log. So as Councillor Michelle Cook mentioned, we want to make sure it's not just forgotten about. Um, so it's, it'll be on the action log, which means we'll review it in the very first meeting of municipal year in June at the, at the very latest. OK. Anything else on that item before we move on? No. OK. Uh, item five, matters referred to this committee. There are no new items. Uh, Right, that's it. Um, item six, Andrew Barrett isn't here this evening, but he provided a brief report um, on Solway Tamworth Limited. Would anyone like to speak on that item? Councillor Danny Cook. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. As one of the founding directors of Solway Limited, I think I'm probably ideally placed if Mr Barrett's not here to obviously take committee through what Solway is. Obviously, the council faced... Um, a large amount of austerity driven nationally um, through the last 10 to 12 years. Uh, what Solway Limited was created to do was to be a private, private company with its single shareholder being Tamworth Borough Council. One of the tragedies of local government is, is that councils have no business in business. And the reason I say that is the legislation is against us. To set, to set up any kind of business enterprise as a council is too complicated with the legislation that's behind us, the pension contributions, how we have to be open in a council. It's very difficult to run a company as such as a council. So Solway was set up in the hope that we could, where it fitted, use private sector conditions to drive growth, drive change, and obviously take advantage of market conditions rather than local government conditions. Now, it wasn't set up to then dump every council service in there because that was never ever going to work and politically nobody ever wanted that. It was set up to seek opportunities as they came up. Uh, to date, no opportunities have been used using Solway Limited as the report says. It sits there in the background for the just in case the opportunity ever came up to use it as a private limited company where it was to build something, manage, manage something, start something, set up a trust, anything that, you know, the, the opportunities there. So the company sits there for a degree dormant as a tool of the council should it ever come to light that there's an opportunity to use it whether that's you know building new rental houses on a piece of our land whether that's running a council service where there's more efficiencies to be made the opportunity is there but it's never been used yet the biggest risk of solway limiters is it costs the council about three thousand to three and a half thousand pound a year in just returning its own accounts which say it's not done anything but it, it remains in the toolbox for want of a better term while it sits there now my personal feelings are and again, I don't like the report when it says note. I never vote for anything that says I note the report because all I'm saying is I've read it. But in the main, I support the leaving Sol Solway Limited where it is. And if the opportunity comes up for this council to use it in future, the council should use it. If the opportunity doesn't come up, just leave it in the toolbox because you never know what's around the corner. So my personal feeling is it's fine where it is. If opportunities come up, we should all push to use it. If they don't come up, it is still in the toolbox. And I've repeated that twice, but it's yeah. the strength of my feeling. So that was just my opening thoughts, Mr Chairman. So plain devil's advocate then for going to Councillor Cooper. Um, obviously the cost, but it's a small cost, right? So let's say three and a half. We're probably talking ten to fifteen thousand pounds it's cost the, the years it's been set up. Um, would there not be a benefit to wind it down, move any funds or anything that's there back across, save the three, three, three and a half thousand pounds a year, and at such a point you want to do it again, surely it would cost less than the money we would save to set it up again. I wasn't involved in the setup, so you may know better, but would it not be cheaper to do, do it that way? Just trying to 
that was out of question. Is that a question? Just a, a question to the floor, really. <clears throat> so you, if you can answer the bit about the uh, the cost of setting up, and then we'll come. Uh, to yeah, the, the worst, obviously, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there were some initial setup costs around um, the legal advice we had to take to set it up, and then obviously registering it with Companies House. Everything that's involved with starting a company, the worst of initial hurdles we had to jump over. My personal suspected belief, it, knowing how local government works, is if if we wound it up and then started again, there'd be different hurdles to jump through, there'd be different ways of having to do it. So would it be complicated? I don't know. Could I sit here right now and say it'd be cheaper to shut it down than reopen it? I'll just leave it running. I, I couldn't answer that question. It's a perfect answer. I think the genuine answer I've got is for 3000 to £3,500 a year just to keep registering its accounts. It, it's not going to break the Bank of Tamworth Borough Council, is, is the truth. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'll kill that in a second. Um, yeah, so to, to wind it up, I think I, it's personal belief again, and I'm open to listen to everybody's debate on this, but my personal feeling is it's not doing any harm where it is. It, it, it is a string on the belt. It, it is in the toolkit. Opportunities may come up. They haven't as of yet that we could truly stack up, but I think, I think it is fine where it is. But yeah, it's, it'd have to be a bigger question of an office, so I don't know if an officer has an answer that, you know, would there be a significant saving versus resetting it up in future? I, my answer is I don't know. My personal feeling is it's doing no harm where it is. Yeah. Bring in Castle Cooper. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, nice ringtone, by the way. I was expecting better of you, to be honest, for that, but there you go. Um, <laughs> Could anyone, no, I meant, could I anyone name that tune? I didn't know. I, I meant the ringtone, not the, uh, not, 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 the, not your inability to uh, operate your own phone, uh, cancer cook. It happens to us all at some point in time. Um, <laughs> however, however, get back, back to the business of Solway Firth. So, um, as some of you may know, I work in civil engineering and um, we use some very expensive tools at times. We use you know, sort of satellite navigation and surveying equipment. However, um, this is quite an expensive tool for a council to hold on its books. I think that uh, the fact of the matter is that, it, if I'm reading this correctly, it hasn't done anything since 2016. It's cost us £3,000 a year. That might only be £3,000 a year, but um, it's a considerable amount of money since 2016 that we could have spent on something better. Um, I'd like to move a recommendation that we wind up Solway Firth and get off the books and... Uh, and yeah, and move on and make a bit of a saving of three thousand pound a year. Okay, thank you, Councillor People. Thanks, Chair. I'm just interested to know where this three thousand pounds comes from because it's not in the report. So, um, just wondered where that figure comes from. Um, my understanding is that once a company is set up, it shouldn't be terribly expensive to keep it going because providing that you comply with the requirements of Companies House, which you can do. I've been a company secretary, so, you know, uh, it's not particularly onerous. So I'm not quite sure where £3,000 comes from. So perhaps if somebody could help me with that. Danny Cooks, Wispin, want to come in? Yeah, again, as one of the founder directors, again, it comes back to the adage I used earlier, councils have no business in business. It just gets too complicated under the legislation. Uh, basically, there is obviously the submission of the accounts, which they need independently verifying, etc., etc. But also, the two other directors, as, and I'll correct it if I'm wrong, as I understand it. Well, the three directors, I understand it, are the leader of the council, which I was at the time. So that one of the directors will be Councillor Jeremy Oates. Another director is uh, Andrew Barrett, who's the chief executive. And as my understanding was, the third director is the 151 finance officer, which is Stefan Garner. Because they then have duties to look after the interests of that company, even though it's minimal at the moment, there has to be a cross charge as such. So the company, to a degree, has to pay the council for managing its accounts, even though nothing really happens. The best example I can ever give you is many, many years ago, and sorry if I'm digressing, <coughs> a member of the public said to me, Tamworth Borough Council seem really, really good at growing beautiful flowers. Why don't you sell them on a market stall? My answer was this. Okay, so you want me to sell flowers on a market stall as a council, so I need a member of staff to do it with on cost, pensions, everything else, let's call it £30,000 a year. But they're going to take five weeks holiday a year, so I might need two members of staff, so we're now around 60. There might be some health and safety legis legislation that says not a single person can sit there on the stall on their own while looking after cash, so I might need three people. All of a sudden, we're at 90000 And then HR is going to say to me, I want £2,000 a year in cross-charge for looking after the staff. IT will be along to me saying I want £3,000 a year to provide computer support. 
and it just keeps adding up. And this is the legislation council suffer. So the simple answer is it costs 3,000 because of the internal cross charges of ensuring that officer time is paid for. Neither Mr Garner, Mr Barrett or Councillor Oates are paid personally for it, but the council has to account for their time. So it's an internal cost of around 3,000 to keep the accounts just running every year. And it is the, the typical tragedy of any level of government that it just gets too complicated financially. But that's how you get to 3,000 is my understanding. Thank you, Chair, for that explanation. Um, I challenge whether £3,000 is an appropriate sum for the cross-charge. That would be the question I'd be asking. Just for some added context from a personal point of view, I've got two other businesses which are, were set up for a reason that I haven't got that reason yet. That cost me 2.7k a year for those two to do nothing as well, so that, with no cross-charges. So just... Um, Company's house fees and an accountant to do it. So, you know, 3,000 isn't that much compared to that. Uh, Councillor Cook was next. Chris Cook. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the way I've literally looked at it, um, to, to that um, company's already cost around 18,000 odd if I'm uh, correcting that, and it's not literally sort of uh, done anything yet. Um, okay, okay uh, um, 3,000 a year isn't a lot if you have looked at kind of like that. But over the years, it all adds up, especially if the company's not actually um, uh, doing anything at all. Um, I think I have to uh, agree with um, Councillor Cooper that there comes a time where if we shut the company down, it will be cheaper long term, and it's these. Sort of start up again afterwards. Um, I um, respect uh, Councillor Cook's uh, um, uh, view on it's in a uh, toolbox, but then also has to, uh, um, carrying on that and the analogy as well. If you, if you haven't Used a uh, tool in an extremely long amount of time. Are you actually needing it anyway? So I think I have to uh, second um, the motion which uh, Councillor uh, Cooper has um, offered out to us as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Cook. Councillor Goodall, you wanted to come in? Thanks, thanks, Chair. Unfortunately, Councillor Cook's just nicked my analogy. <coughs> but I'll, I'll continue with it. I'm in favour of, of tools, and indeed a toolbox. And I think that's, that's a fantastic thing to have in your garage. Um, and if you're using a tool on a regular basis, it's kept clean and works perfectly. If you keep it for a long time, invariably it goes rusty and never does the job when you, take, when you want to take it out. So using that sort of analogy, um, I think the time has come when we, we perhaps make the recommendation to, 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 to stop and, and start again if required. So I would support the, that motion to, to recommend to Cabinet. Thank you, Councillor Goodall. Councillor Samuel Smith, please. So, yeah, I'd probably be leaning more towards uh, winding it up, but surely the detail is in the numbers, um, you know, in terms of costs. So, and also how likely it is to, um, that it would need to be started up again. Um, so, you know, how much it would be to start it up again what's the likelihood, 
Whether we're going to get those answers, I don't know. Um, but um, the other thing is, maybe the most important is the public would probably view this as waste. So if anyone looked at this, so it might not seem like much, um, but it's still, you know, £3,000 a year. It's quite a lot of money to the average regular person who, um, who wouldn't be in a committee. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Councillor Michelle Cook. Thanks. I've, yeah, I mean, I've got absolutely no, should we say, vested interest at all in whether or not it stays or goes. I suppose my reading kind of the report and listening to the kind of comments that have already been made, the report as it stands at the moment is to note that there's no trading activities within the last kind of period that needs reporting. There's no officer, there's no cabinet representation, unless councillor Summers that's sitting, I know he's waiting for his report to come up, unless that's something that he can comment on. There's no one here to give us the answers to go, is there anything planned? The controlling group might have a slightly different kind of view on that, but there's nothing that's saying that actually we've got a plan of what this is going to be used for. There may be something in the pipeline that hasn't yet come through. So... I'd be hesitant to kind of support a motion to wind it up without any of that knowledge, which clearly isn't reported within this. And I suppose the other question is, is that kind of ultimately the question back to Cabinet to say that we've ultimately given up on that commercial focus that not that many years ago we were saying was fundamental to ensure that we had external work streams? Again, not fussy either way in terms of an actual limited company one can be set up in enough in 10 minutes on a computer it's not difficult but have we a given up and secondly are we absolutely certain that there's nothing in the pipeline that this is going to be looking at that officers may or may not have so yeah either question back to kind of yourself chair or if councillor summers would like to comment thanks thank you i've got a proposal then um i don't know if I I'm assuming in screening we can just change a, uh, a motion if we decide, but let's let's see. Um, should the motion, Councillor Cooper's motion, perhaps be amended to be, we ask the Cabinet to review the likelihood of a use for Solway Limited in X number of years, and if there is none in, in sight, to then look at options for one down. So you, you're kind of covering both, you see what, you see what I mean? So we're getting there. They're, they're getting the answer first. Is there any use coming up that they know of? And if not, should they then look at it? Obviously, we can't say wind down. We can just recommend that they, they look at it. You're smiling. Go on. Come in. Yeah, I don't... I'd, I'd like to understand, you know, the validity of asking us to look at something that may or may not be used when we've not used it since 2016. And it's never been used since its conception. So I think Councillor Goodall... Uh, and his analogy of a tool in his shed probably works quite right here. Um, and it's just costing, it's cost us a lot of money. And um, yeah, echoing what's already been said, if we need to do it in the future, let's do it in the future. But between now and the future and the need, let's save a bit of money. Yep. So just to add, obviously, we're, there's nothing in there this tonight, like Councillor Cook's saying, but like you were saying, we reviewed it twice a year for how many years now? Um, when, when is enough enough? So we've got a few hands went up. Well, Councillor Goodall was first. Thank, thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, I, th I think the I, I, I agree with with Councillor Cooper. I don't, I, I don't see a reason to that it needs amended. If 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 a recommendation was passed from this scrutiny committee to to cabinet, and they they thought, oh, we we do have a a reason to use it, then they just don't go along with the uh, the recommendation that we've given. So if they've got more privileged knowledge, uh, that, that's what I would say. I don't, I don't see a reason. It's for, it's for Cabinet to, to say yay or nay on our recommendation. OK. Fine. We've got to move in a second anyway. It was a suggestion. So let's... Uh, we've got... Council Mich we've got the three cooks, Michelle Cook, Chris Cook and Danny Cook, and then let's have a vote. So Michelle Cook first. Thanks. Ultimately, yes, it is Cabinet's decision, but I would still be asking Cabinet to come back to this committee at, a, at the next available meeting 
to actually set out what the plan is and also in that if that is the recommendation it's not that nothing's happened why is it ha why is it being left dormant for so long without cabinet themselves shutting it down thanks councillor chris cook oh uh, yeah uh, thank you Jeff. um again um echoing what uh councillor Cooper and um, Councillor Goodall said, I, 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 even if we stick this um, recommendation in, it's still cabinet which then has a look at it. So if there is anything which they might have there in the future, that'll be their time just to come back and tell us that we don't really want to do this just because we have this um kind of plan if that's the case yeah fair enough but if they haven't got anything there then there's no reason why they um want to keep it open really thank you okay thank you councillor chris cook that's danny cook yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just just to clarify, obviously, I took some questions earlier because I have some background knowledge on the subject. But just to clarify, it's no skin off my nose where it stays open or closes. <laughs> just just to say, it. I mean, if you vote to close it or vote to keep it, I'm not sure I particularly want to vote either way. It's exactly as what's been said. Cabinet will need to look at this in a bit more detail and understand it. But there's two sides of it from my personal opinion, which is I put myself back in my shoes as a historic cabinet member, historic deputy leader, historic leader of this council. If you rocked up to me as leader of the cabinet, as I was for many years, and said, please close down the company £3,000 a year, my question would be, why? I don't think we can give a sustainable answer at the minute because we're scrutinising something very blind at the minute. We, we don't know the full of facts at the minute. So we're going to send a recommendation to cabinet without the full of facts, and that concerns me a little bit. But again, still no skin off my nose. The only thing I would genuinely say is, obviously I have 20 years' experience as a councillor and you know, a lot of experience in local government. There's one fundamental thing I know is capacity is everything in the council. And when you've got big projects in front of you, there is a tendency to allocate your office of resources and you know, the resources you've got available in budgets of what's in front of you at the time. Whether it's future high streets fund, whether it's Gungate, whether it was Tinkers Green and Carrier rebuilding of the council houses, those things sometimes take priority. There was things that Solway were meant to do. We never got round to it because there was bigger things on our agenda at the time and we didn't have the office of the capacity to do it. We're currently facing massive budget shortfalls as a council. Well, every council is, to be fair, because of the world we're in post-Ukraine, post-pandemic. We know there's an £8 million hole over five years. We know that will grow as NNDR reviews continue, fairer funding formula is fully kicked off. We know there are still problems in adult social care and that actually district councils will have to pick up some of the financial burden by the transfer of NNDR. We know these things are coming down the line. This is a tool where we can take an opportunity of private sector conditions. Now, call me right wing if you wish, but sometimes taking some opportunity in private sector conditions can actually drive savings. This council is going to need fundamental savings over coming years. Let's be careful what we shut down that we might need. Now, I'm going to say I haven't got the answers tonight because we haven't got enough detail in front of us. If we want to vote shut it down, absolutely. Cabinet can make a more informed decision. So I'm not sure from a personal perspective I'm leaning either way at the minute. I'm just saying just be careful what you shut down without understanding it. It's in the advice I would throw. Okay, thank you. Councillor Harper. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> yeah, um, I'm afraid my view is um, uh, very, very similar to um, that of, of Councillor Cooper. Um, since it was set up in uh, 2016, this has served no useful purpose. It's cost £18,000. Um, if we keep it going, it's going to keep accumulating and keep going for something that we don't know something some future project or something that might happen i think that's a waste and it's a it's a it's not something we should be really looking to um to do i think we should cut our losses and wind it up thank you thank you very much councillor people thanks chair the first thing i'd say is i think we're spending a disproportionate amount of time on this item we don't have any powers with regards to what happens to this company. 
the only thing we can do is make a recommendation to Cabinet. Secondly, I wasn't on the council at the time that this company was set up. I would never have voted for it because I, I actually don't think it's the business of local government to be involved in business. I think we should be serving the people. That's what we're elected for. Um, so I, I've, as far as I'm concerned, it can go tomorrow. Thank you. So, yeah, we have spent a lot of time on this. I didn't expect my uh, devil's adequate comment to lead to half an hour of discussion, but... We don't want to shut down discussion when we're having it. It's the first time we've had every single member speak on something, I think, from memory, which is always good. Um, <clears throat> so I can see both sides, right? You, you could say we've spent £18,000 already, so you may as well carry on. Right, you've already spent that, you might, or when you cut your losses. And, uh, but like you say, it's not up to us. We can only recommend. So we've had a mover and a seconder. Did we get the motion, the recommendation? Make the recommendation to warrant up sold by trading. But, but would it not be for cabinet to look at options? Of, you know, rather than we can't mandate it. I, th I think Councillor Goodall made quite an eloquent point in saying that it cabinet will make make that decision anyway, won't they? Based off the recommendation, they will be exploring that decision anyway. So, okay. We've had a mover and a seconder. We spoke lots on it. Let's go to a vote then. All those in favour of putting that recommendation to Cabinet? All those against? Abstentions? Okay, that's carried. Thank you very much. Uh, right, that takes us on to item seven. A short project update. We have the portfolio holder, Councillor Martin Summers, and Head of Technology, Gareth Jordan, um, and Head of Environmental Health, Wendy Smith. Yep, on the end, um, are here to go through the report. So, who's going to lead on that? Who should I hand, who we're handing over to? Yep, okay, over to Gareth then, please. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Yes, yeah, so the purpose of the report was to provide a quick progress update on a short project for environmental health. Um, so just a reminder, Assure is the successor to M3 system uh, provided by NEC Software, um, which environment, <coughs> environmental health use for back office process. So um, Assure is a, just to give a bit of background on Assure, so it's a web-based product, um, so it's more flexible than the current system we've got, which is quite old now. Um, it's been modernised for a more feature-rich uh, experience for the, for the user, so better meets our needs. Um, We've been informed that M3, the current system, has now got a D-support date of March 24, uh, so I'll be working towards delivering the project uh, ahead of that. Um, so progress since last uh, update. Um, we have made some good progress. We've now got a formal project management uh, around the project um, and have completed a, a peer to project initiation document. Uh, it sets out sort of governance around the project to make sure we uh, deliver it on time and uh, set out the various project work streams. Um, so we can look at a more detailed plan. Um, in terms of sort of practical progress, um, the environmental health team have attended a, a short document production training. So this is basically to get all of the templates that are in the old system over to the new system. Um, so this is a quite an important step, it's like a prerequisite to anything else happening. Um, I've also started to look at the existing templates in M3, the old system, to make sure we're not moving <coughs> stuff that's not required. Uh, into the new system, so cut down uh, sort of transition time and, and the amount of effort involved. Um, they've also attended a, um, a demonstration that NEC did of their public facing portal to provide sort of self service to the public for environmental health processes. Um, so, still a bit more work to do on that to understand what the best option for us going forward, but I think we're keen on pushing more of the environmental health processes to self service to sort of reduce demand on uh, the team. Um, then uh, moving on, we've got uh, we've had the uh, short test system upgraded, so now in a position to start actual work on the migration uh, and testing. Um, so I think the resources is going to be a challenge uh, in this, given the team is sort of stretched at the moment, and um, I think it'll be the main risk for the project. So NEC have provided us a costed support package, uh, which basically delivers the project uh, with our assistance, but but mainly driven by those by them. Obviously, there's a cost associated to that, so we're looking at funding options for that. And also, Wendy uh, has looked at um, a business case for um, cover, back office cover for staff that are going to be involved in the uh, transition process. It's important we have experienced officers doing the transition, so um, it's better to backfill them rather than having um, uh, project resources brought in. So, 
Yeah, so in terms of next steps, um, we're going to look at the project work streams in more detail um, and develop a project plan so we can make sure we're going to deliver it on time uh, before that end of support notice in March 24th. Um, we need to agree uh, resources, uh, get the business case for new resource signed off and understand what level of support we're going to get from the, from the application supplier NEC, whether that's a full costed support package or we just um, do a, a, sort of a combination of both. And um, then decisions need to be made on um, the self-service side, so which option we go with in terms of providing that self-service function to, to, to our customers. And then basically continue with the sort of data cleanse of, of the old system to make sure we're not moving stuff that's not required into the new one, so to cut down effort involved in the project. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Do we have any questions from the floor? Councillor Danny Cook. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, probably take it on the chin that it's probably my fault this item's here. Um, obviously, we read some scary stuff in the uh, quarterly performance report over the last year about the Assure system. As rightly said, um, our historic system for planning and licensing M3 is coming to an end. I did say that right, didn't I, M3? Yeah. Uh, obviously, if you read some of the quarterly performance reports over the last year, there's been some... And it might have been a wording issue rather than an actual problem on the lines of, obviously, as the pandemic hit us, environmental health, we're not in a position to put the resource into the change to assure us, but that's planning put into it. So obviously it raised a lot of red flags. Uh, since I've been informed, a lot of that wording could have been better worded, and uh, I think it is now better worded in the quarterly performance report. But my opening question is uh, quite simple. Obviously, in the report we've got before us this evening, we've got options considered not applicable. Uh, can I ask how the system was tendered? Yeah, we looked at um, what was best value for the council, to be honest. Um, we, we already run the M3 system, so the transition process from M3 to Ashore is a lot less in terms of resource and cost, uh, rather than going out and looking at um, the wider sort of market for, for an alternative. Um, yeah, so it came down to really sort of level of resource. Was the, was the current system sort of fit for purpose in terms of what, it, what functionality it gave? And the answer was, was yes, and we looked at Assure, and the answer was also yes for that. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think it was, a, it was a budget, resource, and sort of uh, whether the system was fit for purpose. So. Yeah, come back in. So, obviously, under the Council's value for money policies, we are required to tender for new software. Obviously, if we'd made a decision not to tender for new software and we chose this particular software instead, which I think is what you were going for, obviously, we have bypassed the Council's um, value for money process which therefore there must have been a recommendation to Cabinet at some point to bypass financial regulations within the Council. Uh, when did that happen? Yeah, I believe um, there was some discussion with uh, the uh, Finance Director around um, options for um, bypassing the procurement process, and we believe that this presented best value for money for the Council, uh, rather than going out to a procurement process. So. Uh, obviously, Gareth, a lot, lot of respect for you, sir. But just asking the question as a good scrutiny man yeah. should. Um, and I don't doubt what you're saying, but obviously got to scrutinise, um, which is if we haven't been out to the market, how do we fundamentally know this is the best value for money or this is the best system for us? And we know it's not always about money when you tender. There is the other side of it, which is you know usability, um, what's the service levels, how quick would they respond if the system... Right? There's several ways you set out a tender and each gets a, a scoring. If we've not done the tender process, how do we know this is best value for money is my question. Yeah, I think we did, we did some due diligence around what else is on the market and, and how much that would likely cost and what the, what the, the impact of, would, would be on the council in terms of resource and upskilling the staff to learn new systems uh, and tra the transition process, moving all of our data and, and processes in, from one system to another. And I think the outcome was that we felt that um, for sure was the best route. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Samuel Smith. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so this is on security. Um, don't know if you can answer this, but what's the, um, what's the security set up? Um, how confident you are, certainly during the transition and post-transition are you um, with the threat of uh, external intrusions? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the transition process probably will focus on uh, the internal system rather than like anything that's public facing. Um, but, but in terms of the public facing system, that is in scope. Uh, so we have 
the normal network security will apply. So we have um, vulnerability testing uh, every quarter. We have penetration testing uh, annually. So we're fairly confident. Well, we are, I am confident in the in our network security sort of posture. So, um, but as I say, the, the primary focus for this is getting the internal system that's protected by all of our boundary sort of um, security anyway. So. Thank you, Councillor Michelle Cook. Thanks. Um, two questions for me, Gareth. I'll happily take them one at a time, if that's okay. Um, first one is, just going back to Councillor Danny Cook's questions on cost. Apologies if I should know this. What is the difference in cost between the old system and the new system? There's actually no difference in cost, uh, which is one of the, sort of the drivers for it. So. Everything we get with the current system, we get in a shore. It's a natural progression from the old system to the new system. So, but what we are looking at is uh, additional modules uh, in terms of the self-service, like we, we discussed. But I think the, you know, the business case sells itself for that in terms of reducing demand on back office teams. So pushing more self-service in line with our sort of digital transformation. So yeah, so answer your question. There is no additional cost uh, a lot on a like-for-like -like basis. Uh, getting the modules we've got now into uh, a shore. But, the, but we are looking at, obviously, the, the self-service portal, which does bring a, an additional cost, but can be offset in terms of the business case. So. Thank you. And then the second question was about the kind of self-service module, where you've got things like um, self-service for the public for environmental health processes, such as taxi licences. Would you be able to just expand on what does that actually look like? Yeah, so um, I think ultimately the, the objective would be to um, have the public or a, a taxi driver apply for a licence online and, and get the majority of the processing done um, uh, before it hits the back office team. So all of the relevant IDs and uh, anything they need to provide in order for us to process the application would all be done by the, in self-service. So, so I guess it, it reduces demand on the back office team going back and forth to the driver and, and, and a better experience for the customer as well. So. Um, yeah, I guess it's, it's reducing sort of demand on the back of his team, making the process more seamless for the driver. So. Thank you for those. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Chris Cook. Uh, thank you. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so what you just said, I'd obviously said about uh, providing identification online, etc. Obviously, in this uh, day and age, etc., I mean, all of us, all it is actually are online anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, that's not really the actual issue. But have we got the actual steps there to um, uh, to minimise the risk of? The evidence which they hand over to you at, to being altered. In that respect, I actually mean I can um, throw a copy a uh, uh, license, uh, pull it in to a Photoshop, and it's actually streaming kind of easy. Just to alter that, basically. And is there any extra uh, kind of checks just to um, tell you that this other person is this um, who they actually are? Thank you. Good yeah, question. Thanks. There'll be some validation around um, the process. So Wendy might be able to expand on that. Um, yeah, I mean, at the moment, what actually happens and one of the issues why we want the self-service portal is that um, it can result in a taxi driver having to send up to about 10 emails with separate pieces of identification, I think largely because of how much we're allowed to allow in. So customer services end up with a number of different emails and a bit of confusion initially as to which driver's which, whereas if it's self-portal, there'll be questions where they have to have all their identification, everything ready for them to upload. It won't allow them to go further and submit their application until all of that is done in one go. Um, what we do do is we always verify that as well. So at the moment, even though those emails are coming through, 
customer services then make an appointment with the individual to come in and to show those those original document documents so that's the check and balance and that would continue it's just that obviously from a customer service point of view and then the back office point of view it would streamline the process significantly with a portal thank you very much any other questions or comments no well Thank you to the three of you for attending. You're welcome to stay for the social housing bill and the annual report, but if you don't want to, then we understand. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, that takes on to item number eight, social housing regulation bill draft improvement plan. <laughs> Dan is rubbing his hands already. Um, so we have, apologies from Councillor Alex Farrell, but we have uh, Tina Mustafa here. Um, we previously considered this before, before Christmas, we had a presentation from Tina and from the consultant um, <coughs> following that meeting was agreed that this committee would like another opportunity to consider the draft improvement plan when there's more meat on the bones before Cabinet received it in April. That's been circulated with this group and this is that opportunity now tonight before Cabinet. So over to you please. Thank you Chair. Um, on behalf of the portfolio holder then for Homelessness Prevention and Social Housing, Councillor Alex Farrell, we have been working on this um, some time, so just by way of context, um, we have been preparing for the Social Housing Regulation Bill, which is set to receive Royal Assent later this year for some time now, for the last 18 months, two years, and there's been ongoing dialogue um, through Cabinet reports, through the Homelessness Prevention and Social Housing Subcommittee and indeed, as you're aware, at the last corporate scrutiny on the 17th of November, um, where we co-presented um, the self-assessment against those new requirements. And I, at that stage, and still remains the case, quite a strategic framework of the necessary improvements to ensure compliance. So what I will say is that the proposed legislation um, fundamentally shifts the way council housing is regulated going forward and if you recall last time we we set out that it does move us back into an inspection uh, framework so um, certainly from this april and the government only released this yesterday um, there'll be a requirement to upload tenant satisfaction measures through the portal that will um, allow the government and the regulator to benchmark landlord performance across a range of key performance indicators such as repairs, complaints, um, antisocial behaviour, etc. Um, at the end of this year, so from 2024, they will then use that data along with other risk management information to prepare a four-year inspection cycle. Um, that they have at the, at the moment said will be um, risk-based so obviously all the discussions with the regulator so far have been to prepare for that and the the legislation is making its way through the parliamentary processes you may or may not have seen but there's been various amendments to that as a result of that um, committee stages um, and, and discussion not least um, the government um, issuing a reshaping of consumer regulation guidance document as well as a professionalisation um, amendment to the bill which will require all council housing managers and housing executives who are involved in the management of stock to be professionally qualified um, and they're going to start a consultation on that across the summer in terms of what the transitional plan is going to look like for that. So really about driving up standards um, in terms of the management of council housing. So the improvement plan that you've already seen um, does two things. It deals with an assessment of the baseline, if you like, in terms of what the current requirements are. So we have four consumer standards that we're obliged to meet. The home standard co covers everything to do with repairs, for want of a better word, and the health and safety um, of our stock management. Um, neighbourhood and community covers everything to do with environmental service standards, the roles of caretakers, um, how we manage antisocial behaviour, etc. Um, the tenant engagement and empowerment standard um, covers not only our tenants, we put tenants at the heart of how we scrutinise and inform and engage them in our policy setting, um, but importantly also talks about how we 
tailor access to services, so there is an equitable um, and tailored service. Um, and then the final one relates to tenancy, so that's how we let our properties, how that aligns to the council's allocations policy. So from that improvement plan, you'll see that it gives a compliant rating for each of those four areas. And on tenancy and um, the home standard, they are compliant with, obviously, an areas where they need further uh, actions, which we are, as a officer and as a um, a council aware of. Um, but the areas where there is non-compliance currently and there needs investment is on that neighbourhood and community standard and on the um, tenant involvement and empowerment standard. So it deals with that first. What it then also does is, as a f is have a forward look on what the um, reshaping consumer regulation standards are going to look like and the regulator is proposing that there's going to be a range of themes so taking on board what we've said around the four consumer standards they'll be integrated into what will be new six new themes they're going to be around safety and quality which is to do with stock condition they're going to be around neighbourhoods and in terms of people being satisfied where, where they live in terms of that overall well-being there's going to be a new theme around transparency. So that's there's going to be an expectation that through the council's governance structure and through the officers, there are accountable and designated either scrutiny, cabinet members or officers who have got that lead responsibility for its housing service. There will be a, a theme around engage, engagement. So really demonstrating that tenants are at the heart of decision making, which has been part of the council's approach to um, making the homelessness prevention and social housing subcommittee constituted and co-opting tenant representatives onto that and for those of you who are part of that you will have heard those discussions um, and then also there's those themes around tenancy and around professionalization to really drive up standards so you know um, i think the government have made no secret around their concerns around how repairs in terms of damp and mould are addressed um, and it's making sure that those things don't happen going forward. So that improvement plan also has that forward look. So it also gives us an assessment of where we need to be um, on that journey and if we were inspected, what would be the likely outcome by the regulator. So the report proposed to Cabinet on the 6th of April is going gonna, is gonna to deal with four things really. One, it will set out... Um, that regulatory requirement. We already built into the Cabinet report back in November a, um, a policy change recommending that we need resources and capacity within the team because this is significant and additional work to what we've been doing. That was approved through the Council's budget setting process. So there's a, a report going to our executive leadership team setting out the, op the options of how we build that capacity and that team. Um, so it will be about having a, an overall coordination. So similar to like we've done with recovery and reset, we expect there to be key work streams and projects within it that we can then be accountable to the relevant scrutiny committee. It will also have the improvement plan and what we intend to do with the improvement plan is depending on the subject area suggest that that aligns itself to the relevant committee for detailed scrutiny. So for example um, the home standard which is largely about property condition etc might be better at home in terms of infrastructure safety and growth whereas the well-being aspects might be via uh, health and wellbeing scrutiny, etc. So that's going to be worked through um, for as a proposal for cabinet colleagues. Um, but also to cabinet, it will also agree the tenant satisfaction measures data submission from the 1st of April onwards. And there'll be a requirement that that goes to, that comes to corporate scrutiny as part of that quarterly performance pack so that you can interrogate that. Because one of the requirements from the regulator is boards, cabinets, scrutiny committees, you know, are influencing and shaping that agenda and are challenging those things. So nobody can say they didn't know. Um, so obviously that's where we are. There's a, a, a two key pieces of work to do before we can get into a level of the detail that I know that we were keen to do last time in terms of the improvement plan. One, that is to get the resources and the team around it to build capacity so we can start to do that. Um, but the second thing then is to map out 
where those different work streams fit in terms of the relevant scrutiny committees because it's too big a job for just one committee to do. So I'm happy to take questions, Chair, but obviously there's a lot of detail already in the public domain. There was a lot of the, the information provided to the last Harmlessness Prevention and Social Housing Subcommittee. Uh, we also asked to be circulated. So, you know, it is a dynamic picture. The government are um, issuing various updates and guidance almost weekly now as we prepare for April. So happy to take any questions in terms of what maybe is concerning you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tina. Uh, I think we'd all agree to welcome change from the government. And um, good to see Tamilbro Council really is uh, <laughs> well progressed with it. Um, Councillor Chris Cook was first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And all in all, as I um, sort of draft um, report, it actually looks really well. I mean, obviously, there's a few highlighted bits in there which I'm kind of guessing that will. Um, um, be rectified as it kind of goes on. Um, the question I've got is, there comes a time in every councillor's of a life where they actually may ask a question which sounds really stupid. But we always ask it anyway. <laughs> I think this might actually be one of the times. Um, I'm just having a look on the uh, page uh, 9 and that. And it, kind of again, I complete to understand what the kind of process is, where this item might go. Now, the stupid bit is, um, why are the last two columns empty? The only reason I ask that is, because obviously the over text is uh, colour coded, etc., which means it's either it's the um, I have to guess it's been um, complete or it's in uh, progress, etc. But even having a, um, a date on there, this might sort of give us an extra bit of indication. Or I, I could be absolutely uh, uh, silly on this anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Um, absolutely great question, to be fair. There's no such thing as, as a stupid question. Um, I think the colour coding in terms of the um, RAG rating, if you like, red, uh, amber and green, was to recognise what was the most priority. So um, arguably, if it was red, it had got to be done first because that meant we were non-compliant in that particular area. Um, and to answer your question why those two last columns are empty, it's for two reasons really. One is we're waiting final guidance from the regulator on the timescales involved because what they're suggesting is that we will need to have compliance by the time we're inspected. So, for example, if that turns out that we're going to be inspected you know, in the first year or the second year of that four-year programme, then that's going to mean that as we, as we translate this sort of framework into a smart action plan so it is specific measurable achievable realistic and timed we can put the right because there's no point setting a date in there that's four years time if they're going to inspect us in two years for argument's sake so we have got to update that we're just waiting for that last bit of information from the regulator to do that but the, when this goes to cabinet it will be filled in in terms of that expected time scale and in terms of the owner of that work stream, the resources plan that's being considered by the uh, council's leadership team is to set out what the options are for that. So as soon as we've got the feedback from that, then there'll be proverbial names in the frame in terms of, you know, who will be responsible for that particular area. Um, I mean, we fully expect that depending on what it is, if we, if Cabinet do support proposals to have various scrutiny committees supporting different themes within the new social housing regulation bill then those named officers would go to the relevant scrutiny committees to account for those actions that are outstanding that you can see in the different colours that's the plan so 
in fairness, you know, we are where we are with it, and I think this is the start of that process. It's, it's the completion of phase one in terms of understanding what we've got to do, but it's the start of the process in terms of delivering the what. But thank you for your question, because that's very good. Thank you. There we go. It wasn't a stupid question at all. <laughs> um, can't say the same yet for Councillor Cooper. Come in, let's see what it is. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Um, no, I don't think it was a stupid question because I'm going to expand on it somewhat. I think I'm, I'm finding it very hard to make sense of this document. Um, I don't think it's your fault, so I, I know you, you're great. But as documents go, this is uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not very good, um, if I'm going to be blunt. Um, you said you've used ragged, which is good. However, there's different colours in there as well. There's a line of purple. There's a line of there's uh, blacks, and there's I think there's there's different colours of gold. So, I think I think if, we, if we're gonna if we're gonna be clear that we we we're using the rag status, that's fine. But can we be clear of it in the document? So we hold a key. I I, I know rag status, and I looked at it and thought that kind of looks like it's ragged. Although I've never seen purple in a rag status, but it kind of looks ragged. But to have a key in there would be ideal. I think there's a lot of abbreviations in here. Now, normally, when, when we present a document, um, and I, please, I, I don't mean to be um, teaching anybody's suck eggs, but normally when we present a formal document, we, we, we explain the first uh, abbreviation with the, with the actual abbreviation in brackets afterwards, and then we use that abbreviation throughout the document. There's abbreviations in here that, uh, I'll be honest, I, I just don't know what they are. So I'm finding it very hard to even read this document. I've, I've not, I'm sure Councillor Cook can read it and know exactly what it is, but <laughs> well, I, I honestly, I, I, I'm struggling. <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, that, that's, that's not part of the course, but uh, I, I'm, I'm really struggling and absolutely echoing what, um, what, what Councillor Cook has said that to have the two columns on the end with, with target date and owner blank is not, yeah. It's, and that's that's without getting into the actual um, content of the document. So yeah, if we could just have, I don't know, may, maybe bring it back with some document control in place so that I can read it. Thanks, yeah, thank Chair. you. Do you want to come in there? Yeah, absolutely accept that. I mean, I think, you know, what we gave you was exactly what we'd had from the <coughs> external assessment. And, and that isn't our usual sort of highlight report, to be fair. So I absolutely agree with what you've said. We have given a, a, a commitment around sort of having that glossary to avoid the acronyms. I mean, I know that's been an ongoing issue that a number of councillors have raised. So absolutely support that um, along with that key. But I think if it's OK, Chair, I think, you know, what we'll certainly reflect back to Cabinet is rather than have this, which is all it is is raw data, which probably only means anything to me and the teams, to be fair, is that we'll use the council sort of highlight report which we've used from other transformation and programme and project management, which will make it much simpler for you to follow. And also, I think what will be what, what we'll then be, we'll be able to do is make that much smarter. So you'll see what we've got to do in the next year, so it'll be easier to follow. Um, and for you to develop your own work plans around that. So I absolutely accept that. We'll take that back. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's easy for, easy for us, but also easier for the the team as well, and to, to then deliver it. Uh, Councillor Danny Cook was next. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. And yeah, Councillor Cooper, I know a lot of the acronyms. There's still some that catch me by surprise and have been here for a long time. Absolutely right. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, Mrs Mustafa started with, there's no such thing as a daft question. Would you like one? <laughs> In 2011, we gave the government £63 million to buy our freedom from them controlling our council houses. Have you written to the minister asking for our money back? <laughs> Councillor Cook, you know the answer to that. We, we, we have written because obviously when um, it was announced around the proposed rent cap and the consultation, the council section 151 um, officer, the executive director of, uh, of finance and myself attended the round table discussion with uh, the Department for Leveling Up Communities and Housing. And we did make that absolute point that part of the um, consultation on the rent cap needed to reflect that under council house finance reform when we took on 
um, that redistribution of debt, it was to have those freedoms and flexibilities, yep. which since then we pointed out, you know, we've had um, the rent freeze, we've had the rent reduction, and now we've had the rent cap. So that it's does right to buy sales. Uh, yeah, so that does significantly mm -hmm. impact on our HRA business planning decisions. And in here, buried, I accept, but in here will be the key work stream around the housing revenue account business plan, because there will be some decisions to be taken around where our investment planning is within our stock and we'll need to do a consultation exercise on that with tenants and leaseholders I I sent to had so yeah I mean we have given that feedback we have given that response and the government you know did listen because they were consulted on a three five or seven percent cap um, and with they went with the seven percent which made the business plan position a bit better um, although not as we we'd assumed with the CPI plus one percent but yes we have fed that back is the long answer. Thank you. You, you said the listen. Is, is the check in the post then? Is it coming? There's still a there's still a gap in the HRA business plan because we assumed, um, in terms of rent increases, that it would be CPI plus one percent, which, as you know, in terms of the current CPI, which is based on the September figure, it's around ten point two percent. So we were assuming a rent increase of eleven point two percent. That was capped at seven percent. So there was still a gap in terms of the level of income we could generate to invest in services, but it was better than a 3% cap or a 5%. You wanted to come back in there, right? Yeah, thank you. Now I've tormented Mrs Mustafa. Um, not really a question, it's more of a comment, and then I'll get on to a question in a second. Is starting to get a little bit concerned, the amount of reports we write as a council at the minute, where Cabinet take a final decision on the policy that tells scrutiny what to scrutinise. And we seem to be continuously doing this at the moment. Now, I fully understand where it comes from, which is scrutiny's involvement in what's important. And this is important, and scrutiny needs a function in it. But you read the 2001 Local Government Act, which set out the structure as cabinets and structures as we know them, which replaced the old committee structure. Actually, scrutiny is wholly independent of cabinet, yet yeah, we have another report going to cabinet that will tell us what to scrutinise. Now, that's a function of full council, not the cabinet. Now, I'm not going to get involved in that because I'm going to put my hand up and say I've done it enough myself when I was later at this council. It just concerns me the matter I'm reading at the minute where cabinet are almost dictating what scrutiny is scrutinising and it's taking up a lot of our work plan. Now, we, that's, I think that's for us to decide what we scrutinise, not for cabinet. Now, full council has that power to set an agenda for scrutiny. I don't think cabinet does. And I, I'll question that slide. But that's not a question. That's something I'll take as a side matter. I'm going to support this wholeheartedly because the simple truth is we've got to do it. There isn't a choice. The government has legislated you will do this. But let's not pretend any of this is new. The antisocial behaviour policies we had before are still the antisocial behaviour policies we have under the Crime and Justice Act and under the Antisocial Behaviour Act. The environmental works that we're supposed to do we're always the environmental works we're supposed to do. It's just how we're now scrutinised on them and how we're now regulated on them as a council. How we meet decent home standards, we're always how we're meant to meet decent home standards, just how we're regulated. Involving tenants in our decisions is something we've always done. They're just putting more framework to it. So let's not pretend any of this is new. How we're being regulated is new, but we're not being given a choice. So I'd like to wholeheartedly thank the officers that put a lot of work into keeping us legal in this, because when we fundamentally drill down to the point, that's what we're talking about. It's a new way of regulating us, and it's ensuring we're compliant with those regulations. And I thank Mrs Mustafa for that absolutely genuine comment, which is, if you see the first year of our current HRA budget, we've had to borrow from balances, I think it's around £80,000, which is a cash flow issue, because we actually couldn't stack up in year one the entire budget for the HRA. Which says to me, we've got an entire wish list now of works that need doing set out as as was pointed out in a RAG status, these are important, these we really should do, these are aspirational. When we all know fundamental reality is we have, do not have and we will not have on a 30-year HRA business plan the money to meet that entire list. And it is about prioritising what's important. So yeah, it is right to set out wish lists and push ourselves to achieve them. But let's be honest, we are not going to meet all of those aspirations. This is about how we're regulated. And I want to 100% support the officers and the portfolio for the time that's been put into this because we didn't have a choice. And it was about ensuring we are compliant. And I think that's what this document is setting out to do. There is one or two teething issues, as I've raised, about how the, it was set out originally at the first meeting. The colour schemes we mentioned, blank boxes, we, we can get to all that, I think, as a council. Absolutely correct to raise them, but let's just put back in the back of our heads, this is about how we're regulated. It's not about anything new. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Um, it wouldn't be, so it's not new to, to words, but there must be surely authorities out there that 
don't necessarily do it. They're all acts of parliament. They've been following anyway. Yeah. Okay. Um, just on the scrutiny point, we look at the forward plan every every scrutiny committee meeting as well and pull items in. So, you know, I would say that the vast majority is definitely items that we've we've put on there ourselves. But I do get your point. If it was all coming that way, fine. But we, I think we genuinely uh, took a look. Uh, Councillor, you waited a long time. Councillor People, you next. Thank you. I still can't find the question in Councillor Cook's last question, but never mind. Do you agree with me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was. Um, actually, my comments were similar to those of Councillor Cooper. Um, I do recognise all the work that's gone into this, and I know it's going to be a huge amount of work going forward. Um, but this is a document in the public domain, so it would be really helpful if it was a little bit more user-friendly. And can I just suggest on that note, um, within each of the boxes, could we have either um, differentiated cells or bullet points so that we can see each point more clearly? And also, I noticed that with some of the, um, some of the text, there seemed to be a comment that had been added um, and I wonder whether that needs to go into a different column with, you know, notes or progress or, or whatever. But definitely the points about having a key um, and uh, making sure that the abbreviations are explained. You know that's a pet hate of mine, don't you? <laughs> um, but I, I, I think we should, uh, I, I mean, I completely agree that it's something we have to do. But I think it's a good thing. You know, it's only fair on our tenants that we offer them a good service that we are accountable for which is what we've always done and, and will continue to do but it's now you know um, a, a public requirement that we do thank you thank you councillor people just want to come in there um i'd just like to you know sort of support what councillor people is saying and what councillor cook has said also that it is a, a legal requirement um there'll be all sorts of reputational risks um, if we were to be seen to be non-compliant, along with, you know, ultimately, it's always a staged intervention, isn't it? But ultimately, the naming and shaming, the fines, uh, management, government intervention could be the, the far end of the spectrum, So, which we would want to avoid. Um, but absolutely, I think I take the points that um, it, it's about the resources now to take that detail and put it into a usable and smart plan that we can consult with tenants on as well um, but I do think that fundamental to it much as um, the, the points have been made around probably there being nothing new what is new um, is the requirement to demonstrate that and to benchmark with others and to have dedicated and accountable lead councillors as well as officers um, and a requirement to submit new data so um, and, and, and as has already been said there are a range of choices in there and we need to put if if part of the government agenda is putting tenants at the heart of decision making then we need to show how they've done that um, tenants and leaseholders of course so so yeah I'll take on board what you said and you know we'll can continue the journey together won't we thank you thank you councillor smith yeah just to follow on from what uh Councillor Cooper and Councillor Peoples were saying. Um, sorry to bang on about it. I know it's not just about me, but on the um, referring to the tag colours, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm colourblind, so I can't, I can't actually tell the difference between any of them, to be honest. So, yeah, just, just basically to say, um, I was looking online, actually, there's ways to accommodate and make, make little small changes. It's not going to take much time that you can actually differentiate between them, just common sense sort of stuff. So just something to bear in mind, that's all. Absolutely. So just just on that, it helps if you just put capital G, capital A, or capital R in the box. If for colourblind people, it makes it really obvious. Then, but, um, do you want to come in there? We're we good to go. J just to say that that's a very valid point, um, councillor, and I think as part of the update, we will do that community impact assessment in terms of that equality um, review to make sure that that information is accessible. So yeah, take that on board. Thank you. Thank you very much, councillor Goodall. Thank, thank you, Chair. I think, I think my points were just to retort some of the uh, Councillor Cook's uh, scrutiny, scrutiny sort of comments, but uh, I think the conversation has moved on. <laughs> All right, thank you. Do we have any other comments or questions for Tina while she's here? Yep. 
uh, just a recommendation of the committee thank the officers for their diligence in this matter. Yep, seconded by Councillor Goodall. I think that's a no brainer. All those in favour? Yep, that's carried. Thank you very much. And thank you for attending as well. Thank you. Again, you're welcome to stay for the draft and your report if you like. It's all, ni it's all nice to colour code it in our one. Um, item 9 draft annual report of the Corporate Scrutiny Committee. This is the annual report you have been used to seeing each year. Um, we normally receive it in the last meeting. It will be updated following the meeting tonight and the discussions we've had and attendance details, etc., and any recommendations. The plan is then that this report, together with other scrutiny um, reports, will go to the first available full council in the new municipal year. So you've had a chance to look at it. Does anybody have any comments? And if not, you're happy for me to. Um, Submit it as it is. Councillor Goodall. I like the new format. <laughs> Do you know, I was going to say the exact same thing. Historically, we used to scrutiny reports where it's just basic text, isn't it? And that's no judgment for readers, Chairman, because some, there was some really well written. But you know, th this format it engages you and brings you in, doesn't it? It's really, really good. So I'd, <laughs> I'd like to take all the credit for that, but it wasn't me at all. Um, <laughs> um, so there's a recommendation in the report that this committee is requested to consider and comment on the draft annual report and introductory report and thereafter endorse the draft annual report uh, following green for submission to full council following any final amendments and updates to the March 2023 meeting. Happy to move, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much. Do I have a second? Councillor Harper beat you there, I think. Photo finished, but Councillor Harper seconded. All those in favour? Yep, thank you very much. Um, and on that item before we move on, just thank you everybody for the uh, input this year. It's been another good year of scrutiny. Um, it's the, the third year in a row where somebody has mentioned an item, at least an item in the year has been the best piece of scrutiny for for years. So we're doing a good job if it keeps keeps happening, I think. And that's, I believe that because we have a mixed group in here and we let things flow freely. Um, so I think that's, that's been a positive again. Um, item 10, working group updates, we've already touched on earlier, the leaseholder charges. I'm assuming there's nothing you want to add? No. 11, forward plan, is there anything from the forward plan you'd like to add to the work plan that's not already on there? I don't believe there is. No. Okay. <clears throat> this is the last scheduled meeting for this municipal year. Um, on the work plan, we have got some items identified for June. Wait, who, who was that? Councillor Cook, Chris Cook. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, understandably, we have got stuff on the actual work uh, uh, plan as it is, and the time we um, dedicate on that is always actually um, kind of worked out anyway. Um, if possible, though, I do have one request. Um, obviously, it's not extremely urgent, urgent, but if we can stick it on the actual work kind of plan for uh, uh, scrutiny and that, then I think it would be kind of beneficial. Um, so as the um, uh, background to this, there's the, the there's been an increase of issues over time with with the uh, uh, repairs of our, our own stock. Half the issues I've got on uh, currently, it's almost all that sort of stuff. Um, the reason why I want to see if we can get officers in um, to ask them is, apart from uh, um, communication. It also um, there looks like they um, the, um, there there's a possibility that our contractors are uh, they 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 aren't um, um, performing to the standard which we should expect of them. 
and I just want to ask her questions on that. Um, if, if that's all right, then if we can just have a look at it, etc. if we can do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Seems okay to me. Anybody got any reason not to include it or generally on board with that? Yep. Good. So I would say we add that to, to June. Let's not hang around. Um, so that would give us that new item. It would potentially give us QPR if it's ready for June, which it should be. Um, and then any uh, review of the working group um, item from Cabinet. That sound okay? Yeah. Nodding heads. Good. Thank you. Um, and I think that covers. Let me just look here. Yeah. That's it. So thank you once again for input tonight and throughout the year. And that concludes the business of this meeting, and I close the meeting at 7.27. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Chairman.